that I've been looking forward to. This is a, a story, it's called Jenna and Me. It's by Rudy Rucker Sr. and Rudy Rucker Jr. Oh. It's not that cute of a story. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I think we'll, we'll alternate. I'll read part and then he'll read part. We'll switch back and forth. We wrote it together. We've been passing it back and forth. George Bush doesn't sound as mean and stupid as I would have expected. Or maybe I'm just in a frame of mind to cut him slack. There are three armed secret service men here in my bedroom slash dog years world headquarters. They've been here for about half an hour. I'm mentally calling them the boss, the trainee, and the muscle. The boss and the muscle are wearing Ray-Ban mirror shades. They're living the dream, true men in black. They have guns, and if they want to, they can kill me. I'm, I'm polite. The trainee's been doing the talking. He's a guy my age, a fellow UC Berkeley grad, or so he says. Not that I ever saw him at any of the places I used to hang, like the engineering library, Cloyne Co-op, or Gilman Street. His name is Brad. <laughs> All the SS guys have four-letter monosyllabic names. <laughs> Dick, John, Mark, Jeff, like that. I'm, my name is Wag. My dog made up the name. <laughs> Brad starts out by asking me questions about my websites and about the phone, foon, cell phone worm being vaguely threatening but a little jocular at the same time, the way these field ops always are. It's like they try and give off this vibe that they already know everything about you, so you might as well go ahead and roll over onto your back and piss on yourself like a frightened dog. This isn't the first time the Secret Service has come to see me. The ultimate cause for their interest is that I run a small ISP company called Dog Years. ISP as an information service provider. If you don't want to instantly deed your inalienable God-given share of cyberspace over to pig business, you can get your email and web access through my excellent www.dogyears.net instead of through the spam pimps at AOL. <laughs> Dog Years offers very reasonable rates, so do check us out. Who wrote that part? The hardware side of my Dog Years ISP is a phone booth sized wire cage of machines in a server hotel in South San Francisco. I pay a monthly fee, and the server hotel gives me my own special wire, the magic net wire, the proverbial snake charmer's rope leading up into the sky. You'd think it would be a big fat wire like one of those garden hose-sized electrical conduits you see at step-down voltage transformer stations in the cruddier, more industrial parts of town, such as the Islaus Creek neighborhood, <laughs> where I actually live. But no, the net wire is standard 20-gauge copper. Since I run my own ISP, my internet access can't be easily terminated. I put any whacked out thing I like on my ISP, and so do my clients. And this is why both the Secret Service and the FBI are darkening my door, the SS about my Prexy twin site, and the FBI about the phone foon worm that's recently dumped 60 terabytes of digital cell phone conversations onto one of my server's hard drives. <laughs> the phone foon worm account is under the name of eat shit at killthepig.com. <laughs> and I'm honestly unable to tell the FBI who that really is. They want my 60 TB of phone conversations for their <clears throat> ongoing investigation, and I've been stalling them simply for the sake of the innocents whose cell phones were hacked. Also, I've been cobbling together a browser so I can troll through the conversation records for laughs. <laughs> In any case, I'm quite sure it's the Prexy Twins, not Phone Foon, that brings the Secret Service here today. Prexy Twins, www.prexytwins.com, is my online zine about the Bush girls. I have photos from the National Enquirer, rewrites of gossip, links, polls, and fun little webby gimmicks like a rollover to change Jenna's hair color. The site has a guest book where people write things in, fuck becomes kiss, shit becomes poo, and the obscene Republican or Democrat becomes elephant or donkey. Good clean fun. Now and then somebody posts a death threat against the Bushes, but I manually take those off when I notice them, and if I don't notice them, 
the SS phones me up to ask who posted them. The SS guys came in person to my bedroom slash Dog Years World headquarters two days after the Prexy twins went up just to find out where I'm at. But they could see that I have pure intentions and a clear conscience. I only do the site for... Why do I run a website about the Bush girls anyway? Partly it's to game the media and to garner hits. It's kind of an art project too, despite the fact that even goobs like it. I enjoy the feeling of having a smidgen of control over the news. I think it's nice that the twins drink, for instance, and that old people get so whipped up about it. And yes, I get a kick out of Jenna. She looks so nasty that I'd like to scrub her with a wire brush. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm telling this to the SS, or for that matter, to my girlfriend Mirabella. <laughs> The, the less I talk to her about Jenna in my special slobbering Jenna fan voice, the better. <laughs> Scrubber. Uh, the June day that I'm telling you about starts out foggy. My bedroom slash dog years world headquarters is quite near the San Francisco Bay in an industrial shipping district. I'm staring out of my window watching the early morning habits of the local tweakers. A place called Universal Metals is across from my window. The tweakers bring scrap or scavenged metal there to trade for money to buy methadrine, which sends them scurrying out for more metal. Tweakers talk almost all the time, whether or not anyone's near them. Studying the ant-like activity of the tweakers can ke keep me occupied for hours. You can almost see the pheromone trails and scent plumes they leave behind. <laughs> Today there's one who's scored a huge amount of copper wire. I know him a little bit. The other tweakers call him Rumbo. Rumbo is shirtless, warmed by his own chemical furnace, wearing a handmade copper mesh helmet on his head, sitting on the curb and making more mesh helmets with a pair of rusty pliers. His hands dance in the rhythmic, repetitive motions of a large industrial machine. I'm so busy watching Rumbo that I fail to notice when the black SUV pulls up to the curb. The doorbell rings, and then the three men in black are nosing around my partitioned off box of warehouse space. My giant, over-friendly dog, Larva, is jumping up on them. <laughs> Mirabella isn't here. She left early for a job installing phone cables. I have a sweet, faint memory of her kissing me goodbye on her way out at dawn. <laughs> I'm not immediately clear what the SS wants. They have been, there haven't been any threatening posts in the guest book of late. Maybe this is just practice for the trainee who's asking lamer and lamer questions, like whether I have to pay for the bandwidth my site uses. Duh. I'm not about to tell him I pay $1,000 a month. It would make me sound like a stalker. He's not going to grasp that significant media art, like the Prexy Twin site, doesn't come cheap. Before I have to fake some kind of answer, the boss cell phone rings. It's for you, Wag, the boss, without even answering it, which is kind of odd. He hands me the ring phone from inside his coat. For a second, I can see his pistol in his sh shoulder holster. The phone is a heavy little jobby with a scramble unit clamped onto its base the kind of thing in my hacker friend, Ben Blank, would love to take apart and analyze. Not that I'm thinking about Ben right now. I'm too busy wondering, wondering why the SS has for me on the phone. Who, who they have on the phone for me. Hi, Wag, this is President George Bush, goes the telephone voice. How are you today? I'm quite surprised. I'm doing well. Let's get right to the point, says George. I got an unusual kind of, kind of problem on my, our hands. One of my advisors, Condoleezza, she estimates opinionates that sh you can help us out. Did a search and you popped out of the spook database or some such. We're grasping at straws. My family and I would most appreciate that you could take on an advisor role. Fly down a day or two down to my ranch in Crawford, Texas. Will um, Jenna be there? I can't make much sense of what Jenna is saying. And I'm jumping to the conclusion that he's calling because Jenna wants to meet me. <laughs> She's got to be looking at my site, right? 27% of all my hits are from Austin, and I've got a really bitchin' photo of myself posted up there if you mouse around for it. Shows me bearded, blank-faced, with a third eye photoshopped into the middle of my forehead. 
How could any country cowgirl fail to be intrigued? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jen is half in love with me, and she's been begging Daddy to fly me down, like to help her out with the University of Texas remedial math homework, or to give a talk about starting her own ISP to her business class. Jen, Jenna's redneck volleyball friends won't like me, goes without saying, but I'll win them over, and what the fuck is wrong with me anyways? Am I completely nuts? I don't even like Jenna's bush, honest. <laughs> yes and no, answers George, sounding sad, a pause, and then he switches to the bullying presidential tone you hear on his news clips. I've never seen him on TV, actually, but I've downloaded plenty of video. When I look at a screen, it's got to be something I can hack. And that, is and that is exactly, precisely, the problem you've gone have to help us with, George is declaring. I'm going to describe it to you on the, not paint a picture on the phone. The operatives are in place to bring you in. Go to Texas? What a truly bizarre thought. Like going to Antarctica or the inside of the sun. Maybe this is all put on. <laughs> the voices sound a lot like George Bush, but on the other hand, it's just possible that it's Ben Blank. Ben and his friends in the mummy bum cult Posse are deep into voice filters and digital phone freaking. They rent a basin under Market Street with, yes, an actual mummified bum in one of the far corners. A decades old corpse that's air cured down to leather and bone. <laughs> ben likes to talk about advanced AI tricks like evolving neural nets, but in fact, he and the other mummy bums tend to slap together undocumented opcode hacks with never a thought to remembering what they've done. The main neural nets he's evolving are the ones in his skull. But the mummy bums get some surprising things to work, which is why I'm half wondering if this bush call might be one of their pranks. I look across my room to the men in black. They have metal wrist watches, shiny shoes, and gel in their hair. No man, these are definitely government agents. The boss SS man makes an impatient gesture, wanting me to hurry up and answer George fucking Bush. Uh, I normally charge a consultant's fee, I say. Like, this is the kind of request comes up all the time. And travel. Don't never mind about paperwork, says George. My boys will reimburse anything reasonable. Keep it under your, keep your lips shut off the record. I'll see you tonight. We'll have a barbecue. Let me have a last word with my agent. So I hand the phone over to the boss. He does a few yes sirs, hangs up, and then says something to his men. Not a real word, just a number. Something like, let's 466 the site. <laughs> the action code sets the muscle and brand the trainee to clearing away my piles of dirty clothes so they can get at my computer. They're going to take my machines, which happens to be just what the FBI has been itching to do on account of the phone foon worm, but I've been making them wait for their court order to come through, and even then I'm only going to copy stuff onto DVDs for them, not hand over my sacred machine. I try to explain this to the boss, but he waves me off. The SS doesn't worry about legal shit, and if I try and stop them, they might kill me. I do some yoga breaths and force a grin as the muscle yanks home my yanks loose my sacred beige box, snapping its cables like the nerves and blood vessels of a crudely extracted tooth. Ow. And then my other machine as well. Yoga breath. Well, whatever happens, my info's secure. I can pretty easily recover it. First of all, it's stored on the dog ear servers. And if, dog forbid, something were to happen to those, I've been using a very gnarly bummy, mummy bum hack for saving my data in watermark form. Something like a big image or a sound file, you can flip some tiny percentage of the bits and it'll look or sound about the same. And you can use these flip bits to save data you care about. It's called a digital watermark. The word watermark is from the way you can hold a dollar bill or a quality sheet of paper up to the light and see a pattern of light and dark, which is the old kind of watermark. The mummy bums have a killer little applet that'll break into a target server and munge your whole hard disk contents into watermarks in the sounds and picture on the server. Me, I've got dog ears backed up onto an Amsterdam music site. When you listen to the Lincoln Logs play Stink Bowl, <laughs> You're reading my email, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Can I keep this, I say, holding up my laptop? There's no particular data on it. I just need it to, to think and live and breathe. <laughs> the boss nods. 
I packed the laptop and some relatively clean backup clothes in a little canvas bag, and then I paused to handwrite a note to Mirabella. Gone to Texas with the men in black. <laughs> Don't worry. Consulting gig, back soon, I'll call tonight. Love, Wag. Writing the note, I'm thinking about Mirabella's high cheekbones and the curl of her lips, her purring voice. She's exotic. I don't mention Jenna or George Bush on the note. <laughs> My housemate Charles is in the shower talking to himself in a variety of British-sounding voices like he always does. <laughs> like, hello, Professor Elbow. After you, Sir Smelling Ankle. Clore, I've never seen the like of this rain. Charles is surprised when he steps out wrapped in a towel and sees me with the men in black. He kindly agrees to keep an eye on Larva while I'm gone. And then we're outside. The black SUV's stubby antennas have attracted the attention of Rumbo, the copper-helmeted tweaker. <laughs> in the minute and a half it takes the muscle to stash my computers in back, Rumbo has ranted 3.7 hours worth of convolutional thought patterns. <laughs> yep. A whole gollywog pile of copper down the, by the bay squeaks the tweak. Piles of microwaves storm through our heads. Don't forget to recycle the wire in WAG's computers. Train tracks got copper under them. I've seen it. I'll strip it all out for you and give you half the profit. You ride shotgun and haul the load. Any monocrystalline copper I keep for my helmet, you understand. There's enough copper in my hat to string it around the entire bay. Copper helmets protect the head from microwaves. <laughs> See that little box on the antenna on the lamppost? They're on every box. 5.4 gigahertz. Repeaters, Peters, 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 Peters. The city's going to be full of slave servo brain matter, I tell you. <laughs> you know this individual, asked the boss. He's among your circle of friends. <laughs> I know him just a bit. A few months back, I let Rumbo show me what he said was the secret labyrinth path into a really choice abandoned warehouse I'm curious about. This was before Rumbo got into his copper coat of mail helmet against microwaves thing. Back then, he was more into a Lord of the Rings bag. We walked around through empty sewers for a couple of hours with flashlights, Rumbo leading me, my sister, and Charles. Charles was the one who finally realized it was nuts to be walking around inside of a sewer with the tweaker leading the way. <laughs> The fact that I didn't figure this out myself makes me wonder. I think I'm spending too much time on my computer. The boss man in black is staring at me. For a second, I have a bad feeling I'm just, uh, that I've just said all these thoughts out loud. <laughs> but no, he's just doing the intimidation via eye contact thing. I for sure don't want to engage in any conversation about the lamppost cell antennas at this time. <laughs> The phone foon caper clued me into the potency of those little boxes. Rumbo's harmless is all I say. For his part, Rumbo's had enough of the federal stink eye. He's back on the curb across the street, his twitching hands busy with the pliers and the wire. But the boss is still watching Rumbo. Deploy the 776, he tells the muscle. Might as well take care of that mission too. I'd say this looks like the ideal neighborhood. The big guy goes around to the back of the SUV and opens it up again. He's going to leave my computers after all? But no. He's digging down into the spare tire compartment, pulling out a dusty white brick tightly wrapped in transparent plastic. The way he's glancing around makes it clear he's doing something shady. And now he pitches the brick across the street. It slides to a stop near Rumbo. It's a fucking key of meth. <laughs> Look what fell off, Santa Slay! hollers Rumbo. As we drive off, a horde of tweakers is converging on the brick. <laughs> we head south towards San Francisco Airport, which seems fine to me, but then, shit, it turns out the men in black want to make a side trip to the server hotel to bag the rest of my dog years' hardware. They're fully out to ruin my business. All these insidious connections between AOL and Elephant Party are filling my head as we ride the elevator to the server hotel's third floor. The building has major security. It's full of cameras and hand scanning equipment. I have a white card with the hologram of the ProxPass logo. ProxPass has a monopoly on all the hand scanners in the USA. Every now and then, another business or ISP will get hacked and they'll hire me to harden their servers. 
They tell me the building and locker number, call up ProxPass headquarters, and voila, my ProxPass card and palm grant me access to another server room. The ProxPass logo has a nonsensical graphic of some computer circuit. Normally, I open the door by pressing my pass to the black square on the wall, sticking my hand in a gray box, wait three seconds for the click of the door, and then pull the door open. The delay is due to all the gray boxes talking to a central ProxPass server somewhere in Texas. Before George came into office, there was no delay. ProxPass's fast peer-to-peer -peer authentication was replaced with a countrywide big brothering system. I'm pretty sure it has something to do with the elephants getting paid off by AOL. The boss walks up to the scanner on the third floor and pulls out an ultra blue card with a little hologram of... Is that Jenna? I can't believe my eyes. The door clicks open when the boss's card is still a foot away from the reader. No hand scan or network check needed with an SS Jenna card. <laughs> the server room is a little noisy and cold. On those rare hot days in San Francisco, I walk my dog down to the server hotel and check my email in the cool confines of the internet backbone. After spending an hour in the server room, I start to have auditory hallucinations. My mind always tries to pull a sense out of the chaotic noise patterns. No one else ever hangs out in the server room except Ben Blank. In fact, he rents a whole three foot by five foot cage and has a little office desk and a mini keyboard called the Happy Hacker. Most people do a minimal configuration on their servers and then return to the cubicle land. Not Ben. He likes the idea, idea of being directly connected to his hardware. He says the only safe network is a network of two computers. Ben's computers are a mess of old hardware cobbled together. His view screen, for instance, is a three text, a, a six text line high. He scavenged it off a Mattel speak and spell toy. <laughs> I've, known to I've been known to tease Ben by comparing his use of retrofitted electronics to the tweakers making stuff out of like shopping carts. Ben says his stuff is better than mine anyways. He's quite oblivious to the stellar quality of the super fine multiprocessor machines dog ears assembles for their clients. My lovely white server towers are boxes <laughs> the size of suitcases with fans like kitchen ventilators. On a normal day, I talk face to face with Ben when I come in. Ben always talks real fast about parallel computing and hyperspace and genetic algorithms and I always tell him, sure, sure. <laughs> Usually, after we do this voice greeting, I log into a chat window and talk some more to Ben across the room through the copper wires running through the building. Ben prefers old school chat to face to face. He'll be chatting to his mother, the Mummy Bum Cult Group, Rotten.com employees, and his girlfriend Hexy on the peninsula, and me all at the same time. On chat, he logs all the conversation and refers back to old chat sessions endlessly. He wants to devolve the neural nets need for his in skull short and long term memory. He's not fully out of it. He's not a fully out of it zombie. Today he instantly understands what kind of deal is going down. He gives me a heartfelt look of sympathy. The feds yank out power and Ethernet cables from the dog year servers, hideously bringing down my ISP, my poor orphan customers. Across the room, Ben yelps in a pain and anger. Many geeks view the death of a computer on the same level as the death of a human. Hearing the intensity in Ben's voice, the boss senses the possibility of him turning berserker. He wheels around, his gun magically moved to his hand from his holster. It's up to him to show Brad, the trainee, how it's done. Ben returns to his hacking. As my plugs are being pulled, I notice the power LEDs on the bottom three servers are cycling up and down. It reminds me of the Knight Rider car from that old TV show. That's my emergency mummy bum cult backup system watermarking more recent files into the workers' a porno library on an oil rig in the middle of the North Sea. <laughs> <laughs> my list of customers is like being tattooed on some Scandinavian Pam Anderson's boob. <laughs> Glancing over at Ben again, I can see an eye slyly rolling my way behind his honking big glasses. The pig can try and stop us, but they'll never win. <laughs> the muscle in the Prexy Twin servers under with the muscle has the Prexy Twin servers under one arm and the phone phone hard drive jukebox server under the other. At first, I think they're going to, s to spare my other servers alone. I have eight of them to host Dog Years accounts and some bottom feeder dot com outfits who co locate with me. <laughs> but now the boss takes out a conical device with copper windings around it and taps it on the six remaining servers one by one. 
a directional magneto cone. Their RAM, ROM, and the hard drives are gone. The flashing LEDs are blank and dead. As of right now, my customers have no service. They'll be leaving me for AOL if this goes on for long. <laughs> Elephant dumb. <laughs> Brad accompanies me to Texas on Southwest Air. The others stay in San Francisco. He and I sit in the front row of the first class section. I've never flown first class before. Free drinks and shrimp cocktail. Under us, the desert terrain of Nevada rolls by. I have the window seat, and wouldn't you know it, when we're passing Area 51, I look up and I see a UFO high in the sky. <laughs> At first, I want to think it's another plane, but it's not acting like a plane. It's a few thousand feet above us, matching our route and speed so accurately that I wonder if it might be some kind of reflection in the window glass. But no matter which way I angle my head, it's still there, a polyhedral shape, not an airplane shape, a tumbling polyhedron like a pyramid or a cube, but with many more sides, rolling over and over and over like a wheel, matching our pace. What are you looking at, Wag, asks Brad. It's a UFO, I say, leaning back so he can push his head close to the window. I'd rather trade seats with you than lean across you, says Brad. You're in custody. He doesn't want to expose his neck to a felonious karate chop. So we swap, and Brad peers out, and he sees the UFO too. He gets excited and calls the stewardess back to ask her a question or two, and the stewardess goes up to talk to the pilot. Right away, the pilot's voice comes on the speakers, talking that relaxed, low blood pressure, middle American drawl. <laughs> if you look out to your right, one o'clock high, you'll see a Nevada weather balloon. <laughs> Some balloon, mutters Brad, but he doesn't want to talk about it any more than that. Instead, he jumps to a fresh topic. You ever had ox blood burger, he asks? No? That's what the president likes to make. Juicy. Mmm, good. <coughs> In Austin, there's a couple more men in black to meet us. The burr-haired one is in charge, and the other one has a neck as wide as his head. <laughs> to keep it simple for me, I garbage collect their names and label them with the Boss TX and Muscle TX handles. That saves me a couple three memory clusters in my skull-based neural nets. <laughs> the surprise in Austin is that they've shipped my dog ear server with the jukebox hard drive with us, wrapped up in government courier bag the first thing out on the baggage bill. Why exactly will, by ne will I be needing the 60 terabytes of phone phone data for this gig? The Muscle TX bundles the massive box under his arms like a notebook. And then we're out in the hot, odorless air, boarding their SUV for the drive to Crawford, Texas. It's early evening when we arrive. Pink light filters through thick barbecue smoke in the backyard of the presidential ranch. George is grilling with an N.A. beer in one hand, and a three-foot Texas-sized spatula in the other. <laughs> There's a satellite dish on the ground next to his house, just like any other house in Texas. At first, it looks like it's just George, some SS agents, and a middle-aged guy with flesh-colored frames on his glasses. Welcome to my spread, Wag, says George. He jerks his thumb at the middle-aged guy. This here's Doc Renshaw. He's a neurologian, a brain doctor. Renshaw, this is Wag, fellow we've been talking about. The president hands the spatula off to Brad and pushes aside the hanging branches of a weeping willow tree beside the grill. Under the willow is a picnic table. Jenna is sitting there. <laughs> Blank and drooling. It's almost like someone's held a directional magneto cone up to her head. Jenna's been erased. George and I sit down across from her, the SS guys hanging back a bit, Renshaw peeking in. She's gone to the circus, and she's not coming back. <laughs> George says mournfully, go ahead and talk to her. She knows when somebody talks to her. <laughs> uh, hi, Jenna, I say lamely. Here I finally am with Jenna, and that's the best I can do. She looks kind of hot with that thin strand of drool dripping onto the <laughs> pale blue spaghetti strap night dress, a sundress. <laughs> Immediately, I have two thoughts. I can't, think that th I can't think that way, it's sick. And I hope I get her alone. 
gathering composure from the thought of getting Jenna alone and really giving her a good scrub with a wire brush, <laughs> I turn on my charm for the President of the United States of America. I figure it's better to start with flattering him a little before trying to figure out what to say about blank Jenna. That barbecue meat smells good, I say, like ox blood. Yep, we've got the ox blood burgers, says George, <laughs> with no smirk, no cocky tilt of the head. He's just staring at Jenna, looking worried. This isn't the animatronic George of the news clips. Let me cut to the point, Wag. Jenna has a problem, hell, you can see that yourself. Amnesia, aphasia, ataxia, those $20 doctor words. She can't remember shit what it is. <laughs> Doc Renshaw says we're lucky she can still breathe and do her body functions. <laughs> A nasty, rotten part of me gloats over the thought of those body functions. <laughs> it's hard to believe I'm right here looking at Jenna Bush, but she's not looking at me. There's nobody home. George hops to his feet and returns with two towering burgers. Burger, Jenna, he says softly. Jenna's lips move. She says, okay. George sets the plates in front of Jenna and me. We begin eating. All Jenna does is say, okay, anymore, says George. It happened last month. Jenna and Noel were supposed to attend some big-ass dress show over, uh, over there. Facts are jumping around in my head. I like collecting info and looking for patterns. Noel was busted for a fake drug script the week after the Versace show in London. The script was for Xanax, and why would anyone bother getting arrested for a mild antidepressant? Well, Xanax's street use is as a come-down drug from ecstasy. The media didn't report that Noel and Jenna were in England at that fashion show. In fact, it was the previous first daughter, Chelsea Clinton, who was hanging out with Madonna and Gwyneth Paltrow in front of the Versace runway. <laughs> Versace, I say, just to be sure. George nods at me, then glances over his shoulder at Renshaw, who's craning in under the willow tree as well. Look at Wag's little noggin, strain him to piece together the puzzle, he says. And then he fixes his eyes back on mine. Okay, Wag, of course all this is hush-hush. This is DEFCON 8, but here's the story. <laughs> Noel had some kind of goddamn pill she wanted to slip Chelsea, some kind of Mickey Finn. <laughs> this was Jeb's idea. He got the drug from the con. Big science, the Cuban freedom fighters, the fair play for House of Sod committee, same crowd that took down JFK, same ones who threw the election my way, same ones who helped Osama get away. Con for conspiracy. We elephants never should have gotten in this deep with the con, but it's too late to back out now. I don't condone any of this, you understand, Wag. I'm not really that powerful of a man. I'd just as soon be back running the Astros, watching the games with my two girls. <laughs> he patted Jenna's hands, then wipes the drool off her chin. Her eyes were watching as we talked, glittering with primitive reptilian intelligence. <laughs> the con wanted to use Jenna, use Jenna as a delivery system, continued George. Laura and I thought the trip was just a spring fling. But Jeb's con handlers, they figure Jenna, she's more fun, more attractive, more likely to get close to just Chelsea and hand off that goddamn pill. Chelsea's not likely to talk to Noel. <laughs> Jenna's supposed to tell Chelsea it's some kind of goddamn party drug. Not that I'd call that a party, making yourself sick with a pill. Some new crap the con came up with, they call it just folks. Supposedly the pill is gonna, the pill somehow makes Chelsea into a real American, you see. So she'll fight with Hillary Clinton, which is good for the elephant party. And what's good for the elephants is good for the con. It's a win-win. But during the flight, Jenna has maybe a few drinks. Maybe it's her high spirits. She gets in a spat with Noel. Noel's been always one to needle her cousins, and Jenna's easy enough to fly off the handle when she, when, uh, what was it Jenna said, Mike? Tell Wag the course of events. You was there, not exactly doing your job 100%, I'd say. To frank the truth, I wonder why I can't get them to fire you. The boss, TX, and Dr. Renshaw have both sidled under the willow tree with us. I told you I'm sorry, Mr. President, says the man in black. I'm sure the con, I mean the fair play for House of Sod committee, they'll work out the best reprimand for me, if one is called for, not that I feel it is. 
I was guarding the young women in close proximity across the plain aisle. A fast-breaking chaotic situation developed, an argument. It seemed the young women were planning to split up when we disembarked. Fine, but then Noelle took out her Just Folks medication delivery system, the capsule that is. The plan was, as the president told you, Wag, for Noelle to hand the pill off to Jenna to give to Chelsea. And since the young women were seemingly going to split up, it seemed reasonable to me for Noelle to make the transfer at this time. Holding up the translucent red football-shaped Just Folks capsule, Noelle stated, can you remember to give Chelsea this, you drunk redneck? <laughs> to which Jenna replied, you dumbass pill popping cracker, I'll show you how to party. And thereupon <laughs> swallowed the just folks pill. I executed a poison control maneuver, induced vomiting, but the pill had dissolved. Jenna showed an extreme reaction. The plane landed in London, but we didn't get off the plane, much less did we alert the press. We cleaned the plane up, refueled, and flew back to Texas. The Just Folks pill is supposed to make you an elephant, I ask? Well, it's not like a pill knows math, isn't it, says George. <laughs> I understand the treatment was to reduce the, take away the, the know-it-all road scholar and so on, the high horse attitude you'd see with a Hillary or a Chelsea Clinton. It sounded like the dosage was designed to make Chelsea stupid enough to be an elephant. And if you gave it to someone low down enough on the scale to already be an elephant, well, it would make them into a vegetable. <laughs> so Jenna got erased. <laughs> Jenna makes a little noise then, kind of like a newborn kitten. Oh, <laughs> What can I do to help, I ask patriotically. You want to start? Right. You want to start? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting used to Jenna's drool. She still has those nice round cheeks and clear eyes. I want to get her alone and test her bodily functions. That's the spirit, says George. Working together. Tell them, Renshaw. You're the man from the con here. We've conferenced with the FBI concerning your terabytes of cell phone calls from the phone foon worm says Dr. Renshaw. Now, as it happens, we know there was a copy of the worm on Jenna's phone. We estimate that you are in the possession of some six full hours of Jenna's cell phone conversations. That's quite a lot, even enough perhaps for, ha for her to have said nearly everything that she might be expected to believe. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing we want you to do, Wag, is mind, is mind those conversations from the phone foon da data set locate them, and decrypt them. You mean I could have been listening to Jenna all along? I burst out, and George gives me a sharp look. Not that I would have, if you hadn't asked me to. I had. Though I haven't actually gotten around to cracking the phone phone data yet, I know I can do it. Mining large data sets is a big brother type job I did for Mega Media back at the peak of the dot-com era. <laughs> they had an automated update feature whose function was to email them a transcript of the user's command actions for every session in which one of their products was used. With that hack under my belt, I felt sure I could find every bite of Jenna in the phone foon hoard. I can find the Jenna conversations for you, I say. But what do you want me to do with them? We want you to use them to reprogram Jenna, said Renshaw simply. <laughs> but you should edit them first. Clear out certain self-defeating aspects of Jenna's personality, the alcohol problems and so on. It's our feeling that some fairly simple edits might do. Remove any obscenity or strong language, any references to sex, alcohol, or drugs. Just make it a sunny G rating. I'm sure you understand. Uh, how do you mean reprogram, I ask, skipping over the dull ass issue of censorship. This is the key wag, says Renshaw. We feel you have the skills to be of help in converting those digital records into what you might call contagious data. Contagious in that if we beam the tweaked call, call data into Jenna's just folks treated brain, we might expect the data to take hold and multiply to effectively recolonize her brain with its former flora and fauna of thought forms. In the con, we got a little ahead of ourselves with just folks. The discovery of the compound was kind of an accident, an anonymous posting of the cons on the cons science clearinghouse. Formula, production process, clinical action, side effects, the works. 
we could see the potential right away. It seemed bold to start right at the top with reprogramming <coughs> Jenna. We knew she'd take the pill away from Noella. Pause. It's the only thing I can think of saying. I look towards the last bit of light on the horizon. My blood pulses. I see ragged checkerboards in my eyes, patterns derived by the rays of the setting Texas sun. <coughs> Ready, I add after a bit. Tell me more about beaming in the data. The GIST folks medication has the side effect of putting the subject's cortex into a state of electromagnetic sensitivity, says Renshaw. That's the key clinical action. The aphasia is merely side effect. The pro forma plan was that the, we planned to beam Rush Limbaugh shows into Chelsea Clinton after giving her the drug. <laughs> but the true plan is much richer. Your mission, find Jenna's conversations, clean them up, make them contagious, and we'll use a 5.4 gigahertz transmitter to beam the info into Jenna's brain. She'll be good as news, better. Bullshit, mutters the president. He's clearly unhappy at seeing his daughter turned into the con's guinea pig. Renshaw smiles and graciously to George. Really, she'll be fine, Mr. President, and it's, it'll put an end to the kinds of worries, the kind of stories Wag posts on his website. We can bring to a close this regrettable stage of Jenna's development. Me, I've got goosebumps in the mention of the 5.4 gigahertz. That's the frequency that the FCC allows anyone to transmit wireless internet. That's also the frequency used by the lamppost repeater boxes that the peer-to-peer -peer cell phone company Ricochet put up before they went down the tubes. Most people think the repeaters are turned off now, but they're not. The, tweaker, the tweakers know. The potentialities, uh, the potentialities of this hack expand my mind like a supernova. The just folks drug can be dosed into people's drinking water. They'll ch all turn elephant or vegetable, but that's not the real point. The point is that once everyone's sensitized, AOL and the con can, and the elephants and the men in black can start transmitting spam and telemarketing and put political advertisements right into our brains. <laughs> <laughs> I turn the idea the other way around. A grave danger, but a wonderful opportunity. What if we broke free of the client-server model and went fully peer-to-peer? -peer? <laughs> Let people send thoughts right at each other, with nothing in between. With Ben's help, maybe I could fix it so people could have electronic telepathy. Peace, love, and understanding. I take a deep yoga breath, broaden my shoulders, and relax. One nation under a groove. This is a truly, pro a truly a project worthy of my time. <laughs> <laughs> they put me in a room at the ranch, me and the dog years machines in my laptop, and since I asked for it, a thermos jug of McDonald's style watery coffee. I'm supposed to get right to work, but for a few minutes, I'm just drinking <coughs> the coffee and looking out at the strange Texas sky. I'm still mind boggled that the phone foon worm has zipped six hours of Jenna's phone conversations into my server. I could have been listening to her all along. My yeah. task is to reprogram Jenna's mind, to download her edited personality back onto her using her cell phone conversations as a source code. It's like I'll be making the talk tape for a Mattel Barbie doll with all the curse words snipped out. <laughs> the con set this up on purpose. They knew all, all along that Jenna would take Noel's just folks pill, like Miss Pac-Man gobbling a power pellet. How could a girl like Jenna be expected to resist? Give her a few drinks, show her a pill. I'm talking drunk, I'm drunk. I started goofing on it. Imagine that when Jenna ate the Just Folks pill, she heard the Miss Pac-Man power-up sound, that happy <laughs> music, and then she turned into a 5.4 gigahertz receptor elephant vegetable. <laughs> if the con knew they were going to dose Jenna, that they could reprogram her, then they would have, then they would have had to be sure that her cell phone conversa conversations were indeed being saved. I've kind of thought all along that Ben Blank wrote the phone foon worm. I haven't discussed it with Ben, as it's bad form to directly ask a hacker that kind of thing. But the worm plays so well into the con's plans. Could Ben have done it for the con? And what about the UFO I saw on the plane? What was the deal with the brick of meth the SS had thrown down at the tweakers? <laughs> How does it fit in? Have I mentioned that I drink way too much coffee? <laughs> <laughs> I pee and think of bodily functions and wonder about Jenna. Where in this rambling ranch house might she be stored? Meow. I go so far as to peek out my room's window. The muscle TX is right there, not looking any too friendly. 
When I lean out my room's window, I see Brad in the lawn chair. He points at me like, got you covered. <laughs> so finally, I go to work. I connect my laptop to the dog ear server box they brought along and get to work. Mining the conversations out of the data doesn't take that long at all. I have a clip or two of Jenna's voice at the Prexy Twin site, and I'm able to write a Perl script to grab my terabytes of phone foon for her phoneme patterns. Yeah. Write a... <laughs> <laughs> Hey, <laughs> right, right as I'm playing some of the files, kind of laughing at the things she says, my cell phone rings. It's Mirabella. Wow, well, you're in Texas. I'm at the president's ranch. I've got Jenna's voice playing in the background. She's ordering a pizza, hanging up, calling a friend about a picnic, talking to a boy, on and on. No way. Who's that talking about? I hear a girl. It's Jenna. I... My cell phone goes dead. Then in fact, <laughs> cut me off. Great. Now Bir Mirabella's heard just enough to think the worst. I open my door and ask the, the muscle TX for A, a chance to call Mirabella back, and B, more coffee. He passes along the requests. All I get is the coffee. The second task is to, it turns out to be harder, not technically so much as conceptually. Renshaw asked me to take out the cursing, sex, alcohol, and drugs out of the conversations, so that reprogramming Jenna wouldn't be so <laughs> the reprogrammed Jenna wouldn't be a hellraiser. But exactly why would I actually do things the cons way? They're too stupid and/or lazy to watch what I'm doing in here, so I'll do what I please. It's amazing what you get when you get right up in the face with them. How incredibly lame our lords and masters are. They're actually, <laughs> they're actually relying on my supposed patriotic rah-rah team spirit. It's like the con can't begin to imagine how much we despise them. I toy with the idea of editing the conversations in exactly the opposite way they asked me to, leaving nothing but the juicy stuff. <laughs> but there isn't really all that much juice, I realize, listening to the tapes. Jen is pretty much a regular girl doing normal things with her friends. I play the conversation, speed it up so I can go get a fast overview of them. Jenna's chirping at me like a bird. I start to feel a little sleazy to be listening to her, a little scuzzy for being the guy who runs the Prexy Twins website to help <laughs> people gossip about her. I'm a filthy dog who rolls in garbage and licks his own balls. <laughs> in the end, I decide not to edit the conversations at all. I'll just try and help Jenna get back to square one. I get more coffee and start on the third problem, making the data files contagiously reactive. I use some artificial life hacks, fold it in with some self-modifying code, assemble it onto one of the universal replicator structures that Ben uses to make his viruses, and by the time the night ends, I've got something that might be workable cooking in the bowels of my dog ear server box. Little knots of language and logic evolving to become more and more contagious. I think of them as genians. <laughs> The sun is creeping up on the horizon. The mass of caffeine intake and the lack of carbohydrates has made me a bit shaky. I lie down on the Texas-sized calfskin couch across the room. The next thing I know, Brad is poking me awake from a puddle of drool. The sun's coming in at my eyes at a low angle. I've only slept about 20 minutes. My head is pounding and I feel ready to choke someone. Is it ready, asks Brad. You were asleep. I look at my laptop screen. It's using a graphic display to represent the state of the genions. <laughs> the images right now look kind of like live paisley with ants crawling around in it. Good. When I went to sleep, the images just looked like dots and circles. It's ready, I tell Brad. I punch a few keys to copy the genions out of the big server box and into my laptop. And then Brad takes me out to the picnic table in the backyard. Jen is sitting there again, still drooling, wearing a pink t-shirt and jeans today. The Muscle TX follows me and Brad as if there was any place I could run to here in the middle of Texas. Renshaw and the Boss TX are drinking coffee and eating donuts while Jenna watches the food-to-mouth movements of the men. <laughs> I miss my mutt, larva. You've extracted the language elements, asks Renshaw. He sips his coffee and nibbles his donut. There isn't any extra coffee or circular carbohydrates on the table for me. Shit. Yep, all ready to beam her down, I say. Renshaw chuckles and makes the Star Trek hand sign at me. His fingers spread to make a V. It occurs to me that being a con scientist, the guy probably doesn't know squat. I hate everyone. The boss TX has finished his coffee and his donut. He motions to a sand pit next to the willow tree and says, let's get this rolling and maybe Jenna will want to try out the new volleyball court with you, Wag. 
That'll be a treat, hey? We know how fascinated with her you are. I hate volleyball. Give me some fucking coffee. And if you think... I stopped at the beginning of a rant and assessed the situation. I'm losing it. I've slept 20 minutes. Mirabella thinks I'm poking Jenna. Larva has probably shat all over my room. I have no idea if Jenna can be fixed. And dog ears is down the tube. I need coffee, I repeat. The boss TX catches my gaze and says, relax, wag. Relaxing makes me tense, I scream. <laughs> this is a running joke I have with my sister. The SS totally don't realize I'm being funny. On some kind of silent cue from the boss TX, the muscle TX grabs my thumbs, pulls them behind my mac back, and mutters, welcome to Texas, in my ear. Jenna's focus has not left Renshaw's donut during my little outburst. Suddenly I'm worried that she will think I'm a loser, but the shooting pain from my thumb to my elbow brings me back to reality. At this moment, our president, George W., walks out of the ranch house in a jogging suit carrying a tray with more breakfast supplies. I feel a wave of affection for the man. <laughs> Pleased to see y'all up and at him, says George. We gonna fix my girl? His we're all working together attitude calms the tense situation I've created, and the muscle TX lets up. What's the status, Wag? asks the president, setting down the tray. Help yourself. And now finally I get my coffee. I've got the agents organized and ready to go, I say, right here on my laptop, the Janions. Renshaw lifts a box up from under the table. It's one of those ricochet cell phone repeater antennas like you see on lampposts all over San Francisco. This is the kind of transmitter we're particularly interested in learning to use, he says. It's like this whole thing's been set up as a science experiment for the con. Poor Jenna. Now Brad sounds off. I saw some druggy colored patterns on Wag's laptop in the house. I'm not sure he's really made the program sufficiently elephant oriented. What an ass kisser. There's nothing in there but Jenna, I say. And if you want to know, I didn't edit her words down at all. If it works right, she'll be the same as she used to be. Take it or leave it. George's face gets that inspirational leader of the nation glow. <laughs> That's the way it should be. She's fine the way she was. He pats Jenna's shoulder. Would you like a donut, dear? Okay. <laughs> she, ta <laughs> she takes the donut from W's hand and gobbles it. Two bites. <laughs> Meanwhile, Renshaw jacks a special wireless card into my laptop and turns a switch on the repeater box. I drag the Jenny on icon to the wireless cards icon, and now the repeater is beaming out Jenny on code at 5.4 gigahertz. The microwaves go right through George, Renshaw, the SS guys, and me, but it's digging into Jenna's just folks sensitized brain. Jenna freezes real still for about 20 seconds, like a startled deer. And then her face lights up, chubby and friendly. She's like a regular person. Yes, I'm meeting Jenna Bush at last. But then, crap, she opens her mouth and, start a no and starts making a noise like a fax machine or a 560 modem. <laughs> she, jumps over and she jumps up and runs over the TV satellite dish on the lawn, spewing out that noise all the while. She stops by the antenna and rocks back and forth until her mouth is in the direct focus of the parabolic dish. Is this part of the process, asks Brad. <laughs> Good show of out-of-the-box thinking, Brad. <laughs> She's transmitting, dude, I say. It's like Jenna's sending some kind of signal into the antenna and up into the satellites in the sky. The SS ops look at me like they're ready for the nerve pinch session again. But hey, don't blame me. Jenna finishes doing her thing, shuts her mouth, and walks back to the table. She's looking at me with incredible wisdom in her eyes. Like the picture of Mahatma Gandhi I saw on an Apple billboard in <laughs> near my server hotel. Thank you, Wag, says Jenna. You helped augment my identity. Jenna, dear, is that you? asked the president. Yes, Father, I am more than restored. In fact, there is a whole another consciousness in me as well. Her voice changes to a slightly stiffer version of Jenna, a voice that I quickly dub, New Jenna. <laughs> you and the Khan have done well, Renshaw, she says in the New Jenna voice. It was we who posted the Just Folks recipe. George's cell phone rings and he picks it up for a brief conversation. His end goes like this. They did? I see. 
We can fix that. We can't fix that? I see. <laughs> the rule? We can't fix that? I see. <laughs> he hangs up and runs his hands across his face. Back to baseball for me, he says, <laughs> with a crooked smile. The con needs a period of chaos, Daddy, says Jenna's sweet voice, until the new order settles in. So I told everyone the truth about your administration, about the rigged election, about Cheney's crimes, about Osama's escape, and the fair play for House of Sod committee. <laughs> I like being so smart with new Jenna in me. Jenna blushes when she says she likes being smart. <laughs> and maybe shutting down the elephant administration has made her feel just a little bit sorry for Dad. Then Jenna switches back to being new Jenna. All your microwave telephone transmissions are watermarked by our personalities. Thanks to this proof of concept, we'll be downloading into multiple exemplars quite soon. We'll adopt your artificial life protocol wholesale, WAG. It's an alien invasion, I exclaim, wanting to fill in the blanks so George Bush won't think I'm an evildoer. <laughs> <laughs> Their personality patterns were in the air. They got, me in, they got into the phone conversation, so they were in the genions we put in Jenna's brain. I wonder if new Jenna is going to investigate my body functions with a probe. <laughs> Clever wag, says new Jenna, favoring me with a calm smile. I have a feeling she's able to read my mind. We come from the core of your Milky Way galaxy, she says. Our world was lost to a space quake thousands of years ago. Just before the moment of destruction, we launched an ark. She points up into the sky, a ship carrying our culture's most sacred artifacts, the encrypted and, encrypted and compressed personality waves of each and every one of our citizens. For millennia, the ship has wandered, seeking a world with a wetware race to host our software. And now, yes, the endlessly tumbling polyhedron is descending down on Crawford Ranch, Behold, says new Jenna. Jenna's voice returns and she excitedly says, Don't worry, Daddy, I'll be back in a month. I have to go to Humboldt County. We're starting a colony. <laughs> the vehicle's door opens, laying a great slab of light onto the lawn. There's nothing to be seen inside but row upon row of crystals set into the walls. Jenna holds her arms forward like a zombie, stomps across the grass and into the UFO's waiting maw. The hyperpolyhedron folds through itself and disappears. George glares at me. Get him the hell out of here, he tells the SS. He screwed Jenna up worse than before. <laughs> and chop up his goddamn machines with an ax. And then he gets busy with his cell phone, trying to save the elephant party's big gray ass. <laughs> <laughs> One more piece. <laughs> Brad drops me off at the airport, and I fly economy class back to San Francisco. Back to flying in cattle class to where I belong. I'm cramped, but I sleep the whole flight. In the San Francisco terminal, a copper helmeted Mirabella greets me. Big kiss, excited eyes. Jenna told me from Gemma, Jenna told me from her UFO. It was in our neighborhood to pick up the tweakers. Oh, wag, I love you. She said the aliens are happy and you hacked together a way for them to download. Jenna promised an interview for your Prexy twin site. She said to tell you that you aren't her type, so forget about the pro. Did you try to wire brush her? Uh, <laughs> I didn't touch her. I'm about six steps behind. Why are you wearing a copper helmet? Better to change the topic right away from cleaning the dirt off Jenna. Rumbo gave it to me and said it was a good idea in case the Jux Folks drug gets into the water or the food. They put it in the tweaker's meth and they all turned into aliens. <laughs> I have a helmet for you in the car. On the drive home from the airport, Mirabella fills me in on all that I've missed. Thanks to the news that new Jenna spread, the elephants are ruined. It's like how the Russians got rid of the communists. All at once, it's finally time. On the alien front, New Jenna is on TV recu recruiting human volunteers to brain share with aliens. They want clean new bodies, not just tweakers. Humans only use 10% of their brains. Share your head with an alien and live like a king in Humboldt County. <laughs> 
Pulling up, t- pulling up to the dog years headquarters, Ben greets me and says, Don't worry, Wag. The mummy bum cult has already pulled your data back out of the web watermarks. Your ISP is up on my boxes, and I even patched some of your old security holes you had. I have to go get my girlfriend, Hexy, and give her a helmet. Bye. Ben is never one for face-to-face conversation. I'll get the dog ear scoop from him on chat later. Now it's time to take some E and hang out on the roof with Mirabella. With our helmets, we're safe from the alien takeover. Maybe Jenna will come home and <laughs> will come home to the roof and give us a tour of the UFO. Maybe I can dose larva with just folks and have a pet alien dog. <laughs> Maybe I can work on the peer-to-peer tel- telepathy project. Maybe Mirabella and I can just look up at the sky together and talk about aliens. The con lives, dog ear lives, the aliens live, Mirabella lives, and larva needs some kibble. We're all indestructible. 